Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day, there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And oh my gosh, we're going to have so much fun today. We're going back in the way back machine, not the way, way back machine, just the way back machine and making me feel old. Oh my gosh, my guest uh, made me feel old, but fun at the same time. So please join me in talking with Chris Clues today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him in just a minute. But welcome, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Deb. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to hop in the DeLorean today. And That's we're going it. To have yep, yep. So off we go. So growing up in the 80s, with over 20 years of leadership experience in corporate marketing, Chris Clues knew three things very well. 80s pop culture, business, and this crazy thing we call life. He left his corporate career of 20 plus years and combined his areas of expertise to create the popular book series, the ultimate series on essential work and life lessons from 80s pop culture, which includes two volumes of what 80s pop culture teaches us about today's workplace. With the third title available now, which I just read last night and absolutely loved, Raised on the 80s, 30 plus unexpected life lessons from the movies and music that defined pop culture's most excellent decade. So again, Chris, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Deb. And I, I want to thank you for the opportunity and for the megaphone. I, I want to make sure that you know everybody out there understands that the independent podcasters, the podcasters like you, that work so hard to give a, an opportunity to a voice to people like me, who would not have one otherwise. And so I know the work that goes into it. People sometimes say, you should have your own podcast. I'm like, no, 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 I like being a guest. <laughs> Uh, the work is on the other side and I truly appreciate it. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And, and people always ask me, what do I get out of it? You know, do I get paid? No. Do I charge people? No. Do I have advertisers? No. I get to talk to cool people. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and to me, that is, is just what's, what's fabulous about this. So speaking of that, one of the things that people always like to know is a little bit more about my guest. So Chris, tell us how you got to where you are today and how you decided that focusing on the 80s was a great business tactic. Yeah, so I, as you mentioned in my bio, I was in corporate marketing for a little over 20 years. And uh, I do I do really, you know, I love marketing. I really enjoyed it. I did it for 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I like the creativity behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was at a point in my career where I was thinking, is this is this it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, am I going to just go on through life and then, you know, my, my headstone's going to say he's a pretty good marketing guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, you know, I wanted something more. I, mm -hmm. I, I just needed something more for me. I needed to do something for me. And so I was home having kind of a self-pity party of one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to do when it's just you and your dog. Mm -hmm. And because uh, he doesn't care, you know. Right. So, he's like, are um, you going to feed me? Okay. Yeah, right. he's like, yeah, are we going to play or what? What's mm -hmm. the deal here? So I was watching uh, The Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the hundredth time or so, mm -hmm. and Bender, uh, the the criminal, the juvenile delinquent in the Breakfast Club, says screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. Mm -hmm. Now, I had heard that line before because mm -hmm. I'd seen it a times, so I never really listened to it. Mm -hmm. And now, I'm listening to it, and I'm hearing, I'm like, wow, my screws have fallen out. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do to put them back in? Am I going to put that same set of screws in? And you know, we'll go back way before the '80s. We'll go to like the 1840s mm -hmm. and Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. who said the mass of men, and we'll call it the mass of people, lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm -hmm. And he was saying this well before people were sitting in their cubicles, mm -hmm. very desperate. And uh, and then there was uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said something to the effect of, like, the, the saddest thing in life is to see somebody who's who dies with their song still inside of them. And so these things were rolling around in my head. Mm -hmm. my, my dad was an English professor, so I have these, these you know, these, these poem, poems and poets in my head mm -hmm. and, and writers. Uh, and so I, um, I said, no, I'm going to put a whole new set of screws in, create a whole new door, a whole new door frame, walk mm -hmm. out to a new door. What's it going to be? I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I can do something with 80s pop culture because I love it. And I have this line here. Mm -hmm. So I, 
I wrote an article on what the Breakfast Club teaches us about problem solving, and uh, people responded to it. And so uh, Johnny Cade in The Outsiders, another great 80s movie and great book from the 60s, mm -hmm. said, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. I was 46. I wasn't 25-year-old entrepreneur. I was 46 years mm -hmm. old. And I made a shift and I and I wrote a little book and I published it with a buddy who, who knew how to self-publish. Mm -hmm. And people who weren't my family and friends bought it. Mm -hmm. uh, I built a website, positioned myself as a speaker. I'd been on stage as a kid, so I, I love being on stage. And that started to happen. And then I still had a full-time job. I wrote the second book, got a publisher for it. And now I sit in front of you today on mm -hmm. the Power Hour. And I have uh, three books behind me and, uh, and a keynote speaking career. I love it. I love it. You know, and it, it's funny when I was, first of all, you know, when I was reading the book, I am a little older than you. <clears throat> you know, and, but, you know, it, I still remember all of the, the things that, that you were talking about. And my first thought was, oh, no, that, that, no, those, those, those were much more recent. Almost every single one of your references, I was like, <laughs> that was in the 80s? No. Um, you know, so like, yeah, like I said, it made me feel a little bit old, but the, the thing that you continually point out, and, and it really is kind of an interesting thought, is that those movies and music, I don't know if it was kind of like, you know, the 60s took a while and then, then it turned into the 80s, because there were so many social movements, obviously, and things like that, that, that were taking place in the 60s and 70s. But then in the 80s, there really was a lot of life lessons that were in movies, that were in music. I don't know what's going on now. I mean, you know, they just confuse me on a lot of stuff. But, you know, the 80s really is a good way to focus on life and, and business skills. Yeah, so I talk about 80s pop culture as kind of like this glitter bomb mm -hmm. that somebody threw against the wall and it exploded and all these wonderful colors came out. Mm -hmm. And that was the, all the creativity that was going on, the experimentation which is why we had all of these really interesting genres of movies and music that either we didn't have before the 80s or we had in very, very small doses. Right. And then we just took it and ran with mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so, yeah, I agree. I think there were, obviously there were different genres in the 60s and the mm -hmm. 70s, but the big difference with the 80s was that suddenly you could, people could have access to a camcorder. They could film their own movie. Right. They could, they could make their own music. This wasn't something, I mean, it was something that we saw the garage bands, of course, but mm -hmm. if we think about uh, genres of music, like hip hop, for example, mm -hmm. you know, you had LL Cool J, who is a huge mm -hmm. name now, and he started in the early 80s, mm -hmm. and he started by, you know, making little tapes and selling them out of the trunk of his car with mm -hmm. his uncle. Right, I've cassette been, tapes, folks, those, you know, those, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that's how the story goes, but, you know, you had this, um, there were these, there were people, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm in the entertainment business. And I think the biggest change and the biggest difference that we see today and that we, that we didn't see prior to the mm -hmm. 80s, why the 80s is resonating so mm -hmm. much. We're now 42 years removed from 1980, mm -hmm. 43 years removed from and, and the 80s influence is only getting stronger. Right. I mean, just all of the holiday commercials, mm -hmm. so many of them are using 80s music. It's wild mm -hmm. still to this day. So uh, I say that what happened, I believe, was that when you got to around the mid 90s, pop culture started being manufactured. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is in the 80s, they would create things and just throw it out there and they would say, Do you guys, you guys, hey, and gals, do you like this? this? Uh -huh. You'd say, Yeah, we like it, we like it. Okay, we'll make more of it. You're like, No, nah, not so much. Okay, we'll put that aside. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the mid 90s and they start putting a lot of money mm -hmm. into everything before it actually goes out there. And like, mm -hmm. We've got to recoup. Our, our budget, right. our money. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hammer you over the head until you like this, mm -hmm. even if it isn't very good. Right. And so I believe that's what happened. And we, we've we lost a little bit of that pop culture being created for us, the mm -hmm. people. Right. And for us being able to kind of decide what what we enjoy and then mm -hmm. to make more of it. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that that's a big part of why pop 80s pop culture is still resonating. Right. You know, and, and technology definitely changed a lot of things. Um, you know, we, like, you know, we mentioned the cassette tape prior to that, if you had, you know, if you were say a musician, you had to, to be able to create a record <laughs> you know, in order to take it into radio stations and get them to play it and, and things like that. And that's not something that, you know, anybody, you know, kind of had hanging around. Um, but, but when we could, could record on cassettes, 
with our boom boxes, right? Um, you know, it was it was something where you really could, as you were saying, be creative. You know, we we that was that. Hey, hello, folks. Sorry to tell you this. That was when we created mixtapes, um, and and worse, you would call into a radio station and you would tell them what you wanted them to play, and then you sat there and you waited and you waited, and then the second they played it. You poked record. <laughs> you know, and, yeah, and, would talk over the first twenty seconds of the right, song. Right, right. You know, and and so it was. You know, and 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 TV changed. Um, you know, that was when I was growing up. Uh, we had three stations. Um, we had CBS, ABC, NBC. Yeah. Towards the end of the seventies, early part of the eighties was when cable really started going with not only cable news. But, you know, all, HBO, I think HBO was the first one, um, you know, and, and so all of a sudden there was this market, you know, for, for everything. And, and so people really could get creative because it, it, it that I think is probably, you know, I, I have to look it up when sometimes just out of curiosity, when independent films really started going, you know, when you could have those little indie films that didn't, you know, they weren't these huge budget things from MGM and, you know, all of those. And so I think you're right. That's where in the 80s, it allowed the everyday person to be creative and to get their music, their movies, their whatever out there. Yeah. And it was also, you know, it was a time where um, the innovation was really happening mm -hmm. at a much faster speed. Mm -hmm. And I think people realize now mm -hmm. and going back just kind of like to the genres, for example, it wasn't just about uh, let's take music, for example, it wasn't just about, you know, metal or, mm -hmm. or hip hop with music. Mm -hmm. It was all these splinter genres. Right. So it wasn't just one genre. It was suddenly six mm -hmm. subgenres within mm -hmm. one. And that was happening because people had access to be able to do things that they weren't able to do before. Mm -hmm. And then there were all of these groups of people. Um, if you ever remember the movie Ferris Bueller, she talks mm -hmm. about all the groups of kids that love Ferris. Mm -hmm. And there are all these different groups of kids. Well, that was high school for us in the 80s. And it was all of these different groups of kids mm -hmm. who all had different things that they were interested in. Mm -hmm. And pop culture was beginning to recognize that. And mm -hmm. saying, okay, there's this group over here, group of kids over here. Let's target them, them with what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be, you know, the, the Cure and the Smiths and the Pesh Mode, that music. Mm -hmm. Let's go over here. And then over here, you might have the kids who listen to Metallica and uh, Megadeth and all mm -hmm. the, like, the heavy metal stuff. And then over here, you have the kids who are going to listen to Debbie Gibson and Tiffany mm -hmm. and all the pop music. They were recognized. The bubblegum. The bubblegum bubble musicians. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. bubble yeah, and then you even had like, you know, even you started with the kind of the boy bands, right? Because you had the Jackson Five back in the day, but right. then you the, had, Osmonds. Like, the Osmonds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And New Edition came out in the 80s. You know, New Edition was a huge boy band. And so mm -hmm. they really started that whole thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think that there was, I think you saw this, this explosion of creativity that was because they were recognizing that there were a lot of different consumers mm -hmm. and that they were all looking for different things. And that was really the first time that we saw that. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and like you said, there were just so many more outlets, you know, that, that, that people could get their messaging out there. So you really could find, you know, that group, um, you know, and, and, you know, maybe they were, you know, a, a channel on TV, you know, that was, when did MTV start? I, I can never remember. Maybe, uh, I should know this, but I believe it was 80 or 81. I do yeah. know the first song of the video killed the radio star, which mm -hmm. is uh, perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. The uh -huh. yeah. And the bubbles had the guy um, playing the keyboards, or he at least was in a small part of the video, Hans mm -hmm. Zimmer, mm -hmm. went on to win Academy Awards for composing mm -hmm. music. So it's just like, it's wild how many right. things came out of the movies mm -hmm. that, that now today we think, wow, you know, another guy who was the lead singer for uh, Oingo Boingo, Mm -hmm. which had a song called, you know, Dead Man's Party and a couple of other ones. That was in the movie. Uh, and they did Weird Science, mm -hmm. the Weird Science. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Danny Elfman is mm -hmm. now one of the great composers right. in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it's, it is so much fun to kind of look back on our, you know, not quite my childhood, your childhood, my, you know, and, and, and to see those. And, and, but, what I loved about your book, um, and and like I said, I've I've read the the third in the series, so now I have to go back and and you know look at the first two, read the first two, but it was 
the the business stories that came from it, um, you know, and, and the business teachings and, and all of those things. So let's just kind of start going through some of those now. OK, so the, I do admit, you know, I was reading this last night and there was one complete laugh out loud moment when I was reading the book. Um, and that was when you were talking about doing the thing is greater than buying the thing. And bless your heart, you talk to, see, I live in the South. You live in the South too. Um, you know, I when when you were talking about doing the house painting and the spider scared you yeah. so much, you passed out. I'm like, yep, I'm there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, spiders are my thing. I'd say, you know, Indiana Jones, if, uh, you know, with his whole thing with the snakes, why did it have to be snakes? And, uh, and for me, it's spiders. Why did it have to be spiders? Yeah, I was... I had just, for those of you that listen, I had a, you haven't read the book, I, I had a summer job. And by the way, in my book, uh, Raised on the 80s, and my other books as well, mm -hmm. uh, I was always taught that self-deprecating humor is the best humor. Right. Um, I know. And you, yeah, you've got that. And you've got pictures of you, it, it, know. you know, illustrating all this stuff, which were just the cutest things. Some unfortunate pictures from the 80s. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but the 80s did that as well. We had very unfortunate pictures when we were in the 80s. We and, had weird um, hair. <laughs> you know, weird clothes. I mean, I'm glad that the fashion, the only thing that kind of survived mm -hmm. were vans. Vans are spectacular. Mm -hmm. Yep, vans are, vans are your go-to shoes. I learned that in the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a great brand. I mean, that, that's a great business story in and of itself, mm -hmm. the van story. I, I would, mm -hmm. I, you know, for those of you listening that are business people, of course, Highly recommend that you Google the story of Vans, the brand. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really great mm -hmm. American business story. Um, I just love, I love, it started in 66 mm -hmm. in a small regional brand in Southern mm -hmm. California. And where they are today, it's just amazing, the right. evolution of mm -hmm. Vans were. Uh, so yeah, I was I had I was house painting and mm -hmm. uh, up uh, very high and yes a spider uh, ended up on my face on my head and my face and I passed out and um, yeah and you just, were swinging I was, <laughs> passed, <laughs> out, passed out and my buddies had to drag me in it's uh, yeah I, I I'm not it's not my proudest moment um, but uh, the the humor in our lives typically come from the our our, our moments that we're not right. most proud of. Um, right. or, you know, and, and as you said, you do talk about that in the book. You know, there are a lot of times where, you know, we we forget that humor, you know, and and, and it is it, it's an, it is a, a great way to get our message across. Um, but, you know, kind of one of the themes throughout the book. Now, you know, there were obviously some very specific movies that that address this, but were about being yourself and being unique and whether that's as a business owner, an employee, all of these various things. So let's let's kind of expand on that because of course the big one is the breakfast club. Um, you know, and, and you're probably gonna hang up on me. I've not watched the breakfast club, but I watch Dirty Dancing. So see, I gotcha. <laughs> I have not seen Dirty Dancing and I know that makes people just really unhappy, but uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a reason behind it. If you read the I book. know, yeah, you gotta read the book to, to see why you know, because that, that was five, another set of pictures. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, and a Patrick Swayze, Patrick Swayze is uh, by far, by far, my favorite actor and and probably one of my favorite humans mm -hmm. um, from the '80s. So um, the fact that I haven't seen Dirty Dancing, you'll see why. Uh, I, yeah, I won't but, hum. I I could start humming, and and you would just yeah, you'd hang up on me. I know you might see me swinging here, passing out. Uh, so I um I am the only one who can officially say I did put baby in the corner. So I, I do want to um, touch back on the uh, doing a thing is greater than buying a thing real quick. That's a lesson from Can't Buy Me Love, mm -hmm. uh, another great 80s movie. One of those movies that can only, in my opinion, be made in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Dempsey. Now, mm -hmm. you may or may not know. Mc McDreamy. McSteamy? McDreamy? Which one was he? <laughs> Dr. McDreamy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> McSteamy would have been even better, but yes, he's Pat Dr. McDreamy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Patrick Dempsey, you know, in the 80s, he played kind of like the outcast, the nerd, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call him. That particular character and then he becomes dr mcdreamy so anything's possible of course mm -hmm. um but yes it's a, it's a great movie can't buy me love great romantic comedy mm -hmm. highly recommended and it does teach us a couple of lessons but a really important one about memories like experiences mm -hmm. and you know when you look back on your life and you think about the things that you bought versus the things that you did mm -hmm. and so what do you remember and what can you tell right. i can tell so many stories about my experiences and it's hard to remember some of the things that I purchased at the mm -hmm. time. It was the best thing I'd ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. But looking back, I'm like, what did I really get out of it? Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of memories do I have? Yeah, sure. Some things that we purchase in life mm -hmm. create amazing memories, our homes, for example. Mm -hmm. 
but uh but in general like the things that we purchase in life and then we look back and we think gosh you know okay that served a purpose for 30 days mm -hmm. but man when i went on this trip or mm -hmm. i did i met this person right. or i experienced this thing mm -hmm. and i've told that story for mm -hmm. 30 40 50 years mm -hmm. i think that's a right yeah well and and it is about doing as opposed to buying um, you know, and, and I think part of that is in how we learn things too. You know, if, if we have to learn it ourselves, yes. then it's going to stick with us. If we just say, you know, Hey, you go do this you now, whatever. That's right. And so that's the, my, my, my whole theme is mm -hmm. about the, the, the best lessons for life come from most and work come mm -hmm. from the most unexpected of places. Mm -hmm. Not expecting to learn, I think is when we learn, mm -hmm. uh, best. Right. That's I don't say one of the best. Mm -hmm. So yeah, back to the Breakfast Club, great mm -hmm. example, right? Here's these five kids in detention. What could we possibly learn from them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because kids. they were all so very different. Very different. Yeah, very different. And in the book, I actually have a lesson from each one of the characters, each one of the students, and a lesson from Prin Principal Vernon mm -hmm. and Carl, the janitor. Mm -hmm. uh, because probably if I get into my fifties here, I relate a little more to Principal Vernon than I do the kids. Uh, but you know, mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I, uh, I I think you talked about the theme of mm -hmm. being ourselves mm -hmm. and being who we are. Mm -hmm. And there's a great uh, moment in the Breakfast Club. Andrew, the athlete, played by mm -hmm. Emilio Estevez, the kid that we would all look to as like the popular kid, the athlete, like right, mm -hmm. you no know, one that could bother him. He has the perfect life. Perfect life, right? Mm -hmm. But no, actually, there's a lot going on in his life as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's a whole thing about everybody's facing a struggle. You know, you just don't know sometimes, and so. Mm -hmm. He, he is facing a struggle. And what he says at one point in the movie is that we're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it. That's all. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really important moment because mm -hmm. he opens himself up mm -hmm. to all of the other kids. And he admits that, hey, you may look at me as the athlete, as the mm -hmm. kid who has everything. But ultimately, like, I'm just a little bizarre, too. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of things going on. There's things that are not good in my life. Mm -hmm. And he admits that. He opens up to it. But most importantly, he's say, say, saying to everybody, just be you. And for kids mm -hmm. in high school, this is such an important lesson right. because there are going to be times in, in, in school where you're going to feel like, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Like, what what is going on? Mm -hmm. Just remember to be always be you. The people that matter, mm -hmm. the people in your life that are going to love you and like you for who you are, those are the people that matter. They're never going to leave your side, right. no matter what. Mm -hmm. If somebody does leave your side because of who you are or who you want to mm -hmm. become, then you they didn't need them there. Didn't need them. They weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Just be you um, right. is a really, really important lesson. And it's a really important theme, as you mentioned, throughout 80s movies that I think a lot of people have missed. There's so many movies that talk about the idea of just being you, of, of being who you are and being proud of who you are. And I'll give you one example that's not in my book, but I think is such an important movie for the 80s. And it sounds silly to say, but Revenge of the Nerds. Mm hmm Right. It's an important moment in movie history because it was the first time that I can recall where the nerds were the heroes. Mm -hmm. We were rooting for them. Right. Before the they'd always been picked on, right. you know, they yeah. were just kind of the afterthoughts if they were even there at all. And they never fought back or they mm -hmm. rarely did. You know, here they're, they're the heroes. We're rooting for them. And suddenly there was this shift mm -hmm. in who the hero was in a movie. Like, who is the real hero here? Mm -hmm. You know, who, who are the people that we, we're going to root for? Right. And what was great about 80s, again, is that they picked up on that theme and they thought, wow, audiences really love this. They're relating to it. Let's do more of that. Right. And we started to see these characters in 80s movies that became heroes mm -hmm. that may not have been before. Del Griffith from Planes, Trains, Automobiles, which is a fantastic movie and perfect for this time of year. It's the best mm -hmm. Thanksgiving movie ever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great holiday movie. Uh, John Candy, you can never go wrong with John Candy and Steve Martin, but John Candy playing Del Griffith. Mm -hmm. Del Griffith is the hero in that movie. Right. That character would have never been a hero before the 80s. No, but no. He's a hero in that movie. Yeah. And a really important hero, by the way, if you if you go watch the movie again mm -hmm. or you haven't watched it in a while, go back and watch the movie. He teaches us a lot about judgment mm -hmm. and judging people. Mm -hmm. And that's that that it is he is a hero um through and through. And he's also a great salesman. He 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 teaches us a very valuable lesson about business. We talk about you know what makes a great business is a brand or great mm -hmm. leadership um and the and a great product or service. And those are all important, but really what makes a great company is a great salesperson. Right. 
can't have a great company without a great salesperson. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a company of one, you got to mm -hmm. be a great salesperson mm -hmm. for your company. Right. Or you're not going to have a company. That's right. Yeah. And Del Griffith is a great, I mean, he sells shower mm -hmm. curtain rings as earrings to people at a bus stop. So yes, mm -hmm. he's a great salesperson. Right. You know, and these, it, it's, it really was fun. You know, like I said, going back and, and thinking about these movies and now you know, I'm thinking, I need to watch a lot of these again, because when they first came out, we went, oh, you know, and, and I think a lot of times we'd get, well, that was different. Um, you know, it's certain because it certainly was not what we had in the seventies. Um, you know, and, and so when they change, when the music changed, you know, like you were saying, and, and now when we go back and, and, you know, you, you talk about this in the book in, in, in your speaking is that some of the people who are now the most interested in all of this are the millennials, um, you know, and, and they're looking back and I think it's, I always laugh when people are like, ew, millennials. I'm like, excuse me, you raised them. <laughs> you know? But what we, you know, I think what we saw was that they needed to stand up for themselves. That was what we taught them. And that they needed to think that it was more than just the material things, um, which, you know, when did the material, when did, when did Madonna start? Yeah, you know, the, the ultimate material girl, right? Um, and, yeah. but it was, yeah, you know, and, and, and and so we taught that generation and now they're realizing well that's that was the 80s you know that's that's where all of this came about and of course those were when those kids were born i think right um and so that's kind of where that all came from was you know you you had to be unique you had to be you um you know the things weren't the most important thing in the world all of those things were what we taught them yeah. And so you have, you know, the 80s was a great, um, there was this breakthrough of uh, people, uh, particularly in the entertainment business, but in general as well, where they were actually, you know, had the ability to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And we, we go back and you, you mentioned Madonna, but mm -hmm. there were, you know, people like Boy George, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Oh, 10 years before he would have, five years before he would have never, ever been able to, to become as popular. Yeah, right. I mean, there was there was David Bowie, um, mm -hmm. but not, nothing, you know, not to the extent that the, where Boy George was in the 80s. And, you know, he's still doing his thing. It's right. great. Mm -hmm. You know, what a fantastic career and what a great mm -hmm. entertainer. And what an important person mm -hmm. um, from the 80s that, that came out of that glitter bomb of creativity that exploded. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I mean, he came right out of it. And there were so many like him um, that really kind of like changed the landscape. Mm -hmm. And I do think that even people in their 20s, they come up to me and they're they're talking to me about 80s pop culture. And I want to focus on two things here. The first is, I think part of it is that, you know, when they see a, movie, a show like Stranger Things, they have the ability to Google, you know, something like they'll hear a song like Pretty in Pink and then they'll mm -hmm. go Pretty in Pink. And it takes them down this massive rabbit hole of movies and music because Pretty in Pink isn't just a song. It's a movie. Mm -hmm. Right. The movie was directed by this guy, John Hughes, mm -hmm. who also did all these movies, Ferris Bueller mm -hmm. and the of playing, playing trains automobiles. Oh, and you like you like pretty and pink. You like psychedelic furs. Here's mm -hmm. the cure. Fashion, mm -hmm. fashion mode and Smiths. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, if I wanted to learn about Led Zeppelin, who was a little before my time, mm -hmm. my option was to ask the guy sitting on the Camaro in the jean jacket, smoking, a right, cigarette. blasting it out of his car speakers. I'm not doing it. It's not mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know. Is it, you know, I don't know what that guy's going to do. Maybe he'll punch me in the head. Mm -hmm. But he, I'm not going to like ask him and I'm not going to ask my parents because that I'm 13. That's not going to be cool. Right. And, and they were Patsy Cline fans, right? <laughs> right. And even if they do, like, I just, I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't go to them. And so um, going back to the eighties and these really unique characters, and I want to focus on one that I talk about in, in, in the newest book uh, raised on the eighties. And mm -hmm. it's in the fourth or fifth chapter and it's a musician Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy, um, we call Michael Jackson the king of pop. Mm -hmm. I call this guy the king of music, and his name was Prince. Mm -hmm. And Prince, uh, in 1987, now he was already getting nominated for Academy Awards, winning mm -hmm. Grammys. We still had him for another 29 years, mm -hmm. lucky us, right? Right. And so Prince, uh, Prince was, was just magical, and he was writing music for people and doing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There was an alt, alt singer named Suzanne Vega. Mm -hmm. And Suzanne Vega had a song uh, called Left of Center, which was on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. Mm -hmm. But she was no, I mean, Prince was known Prince by was one. Prince was mm -hmm. Prince. He's known by one name around the world. When you're known by one name, you're doing okay. Mm -hmm. So here's Prince. And he hears her song, My Name is Luca. Now, mm -hmm. this was a song that really kind of put her on the map. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It was a very serious song about child abuse. My name is Luca. I live on the second floor. I live upstairs from you. I'm not going to sing it or people are going to cut out of this podcast right now. Uh, Prince heard it. He was so moved by it that he actually penned a handwritten note to her. And you can Google this handwritten note. If you mm -hmm. Google Prince and Suzanne Vega, you'll see it. And the handwritten note said, Dear Suzanne, Luca is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. And you can go Google it right now. Mm -hmm. It's, it's I mean, his handwriting is magical, everything about it. Mm -hmm. but there's a couple of lessons that he taught us there about mm -hmm. leadership. Right. One of those is that leaders share the stage of success. Mm -hmm. Rulers yeah. keep everybody below the stage. Rulers, mm -hmm. when they get to the stage of success, they're like, nope, you stay down here. I don't want to share it. This is my space. Mm -hmm. Leaders share the stage. That's what he did. He saw somebody else doing something great. And he said, there's room up here on this mm -hmm. stage for you. I see you greatness. Mm -hmm. So keep it up. Keep doing it. That's what leaders do. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that encouragement doesn't cost a thing. Right. All of us can go out and encourage somebody today. Mm -hmm. Anybody in our mm -hmm. life, that is, including somebody on our team. Maybe they had a bad day. Mm -hmm. Maybe a project didn't go the way that we wanted it mm -hmm. to. Encouragement is such a huge thing, and it doesn't cost a thing to do mm -hmm. it. And the third thing is that the handwritten note is a lost art. For all of you leaders out there, email's easy. Email's mm -hmm. great. You I save my handwritten notes. There you go. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, um, as you get older and, you know, your, your, your parents move on, um, you go through their things and you find that they've kept all of these mm -hmm. notes and cards. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. That handwritten note, is, is, it's really, really, it's a valuable thing for most people. Mm -hmm. And if you're a leader out there, particularly if your team's working a little virtual or maybe you're remote a little bit and you send them a handwritten note over an email, it makes mm -hmm. such a huge difference right. to somebody. They'll take a picture of it and put it on their on their mm -hmm. social. Media. Look what my look what look, I got. Mm -hmm. Look at my you know my CEO sent me. This is incredible. Um, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So just a simple handwritten note. Prince mm -hmm. taught us some really valuable lessons about leadership. Right. right. You know, and and there's there's other leadership examples in your book, and and I love them because it, there's there is a true difference between a leader and the owner, the manager, the whoever. Because you know it's it, it, and. Oh, uh, you know, frequently we see the leader as not being the person in charge, right? You know, but they're the people who holds everything together, who is the one who goes up and immediately congratulates somebody or if something goes wrong, they go up and they say, you know what, we're going to fix this. What can we do next time? How can, how can we do this? And the, you know, the, the people in charge, if they even notice, you know, a lot of times they're the ones heaping on the criticism. So, you know, to, to be that person that says, thank you, great job. I mean, any of those, that is what makes you that leader. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's another great example. Uh, one of my favorite actors, again, from the 80s, not my favorite, Patrick Swayze, number one. My, 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 my dog, Bodie's named after his character from Point Break, uh, Eddie Murphy. So Eddie Murphy had some great characters in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Billy Ray Valentine in Trading Places. Right. Uh, now, this is a uh, holiday movie. It was It's it's around the Christmas season, mm -hmm. so I call it a holiday movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's Dan Aykroyd, Eddie Murphy, and Jamie mm -hmm. Lee Curtis. That should be enough to get you to the television. Right. To watch. Yeah, those three cool. right there, kaboom. Mm -hmm. Get you there. Uh, so in any case, it's a fantastic movie. There's a lot of great underlying, um, social, uh, messages in the movie. Another thing that I think people miss from the eighties is that there were a lot of really important messages woven into these movies. They did it in a really entertaining way, mm -hmm. uh, but they were, they really were, you know, um, touching on some very important issues mm -hmm. and training places does that. So I won't tell you much more than that, except that you need to see it, but there is, there is a, uh, a moment where Billy Ray Valentine played by Eddie Murphy. Now, when we meet him. He's this really intelligent guy, but he's a con man, you know, right. and he this money. very intelligent. Mm -hmm. And he is, without getting too much into the story, he's put into a position where he is now going to be a commodities broker. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is something he wasn't necessarily prepared for. But we all know that the character can do it because we've seen mm -hmm. how intelligent he is. Mm -hmm. He's not so sure. So right. his first day of work, he shows up and Coleman, the butler, is standing there and he looks up at the building, this massive building, and he says, you know, Coleman, what if I can't do this job? What if I'm not what they expected? And Coleman says, just be yourself, sir. They can't take that away from you. Now, if that was the only lesson that we learned, just to be yourself, we talked about that earlier and how important it is to just be yourself. 
um, and that the people who love and like you and the people that matter in your life will will you know surround you. Uh, but this this one goes deeper. Because when we think about this in the context of knowing how smart he is and how this commodities broker's job is going to be a no-brainer for him. Based on what we've seen about him, he's going to have no issues with this. We Today, we kind of call this imposter syndrome. That's what we hear, that buzzword imposter syndrome. But my lesson from this was that, you know, you can be con you can be good at what you do and st still question yourself. Confident people question themselves. Arrogant people question others. And that's what you're talking about, the leadership, the pointing the fingers, right? This idea of arrogance make you know pointing out somebody else's faults or blaming other people when you're a confident person you're you're absolutely going to question yourself this does not mean that you have a lack of confidence right. i question myself every time i'm about to get mm -hmm. on stage mm -hmm. are they going to like me am i going to mm -hmm. do a good job is this going to resonate with them mm -hmm. did i prepare enough and i know that i did but i question myself and that's what helps me get better mm -hmm. we get better when we question ourselves mm -hmm. And that's once we stop questioning ourselves, where do we go? Right. Well, we think that we're somehow perfect. And mm -hmm. you know, in the words of Enid Strick, the church lady from the 80s, isn't that special? Isn't that special? Mm -hmm. It's special. We think that you're perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I get the nasal in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was so great, Dana Carvey. Uh, and or or we question others. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see, unfortunately, today in a mm -hmm. lot of situations is we see people questioning other people mm -hmm. instead of looking inward and questioning right themselves or mm -hmm. trying to find um, a solution rather than pointing the finger the mm -hmm. circular fire squad that we that we often talk mm -hmm. about so it's okay to question yourself i do it all the time you know i have that mm -hmm. moment the sally fields moment when she got the academy award you like me you really like me yeah i I'm, know I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. before i get on stage are they gonna like me am i gonna do a good job and that's perfectly fine in fact it's good to do that right yeah i remember a long time ago i heard an interview with the the absolutely fabulous barbara streisand and, and she said that any, any time she would get ready to perform, she, it, it's the nerves almost overtook her because it was this, what if something happens? What if I'm not good enough? What if they don't like me? And then of course she got on stage and she's Barbara Streisand, right? Um, but, but yeah, it's that, it, and that, that little self doubt actually kind of kicks up the adrenaline. And then we do better. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. That's been one of the hard things about doing what you and I do remotely because there's no feedback, <laughs> you know, there's no audience, um, you know, and, and, and we do play on that. We feed from it or, you know, we notice hmm, the front row has gone to sleep. Something's wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and, and on zoom, they just turn their cameras off and you're like, are they even still there? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it, they're, they're, being that leader really is, it's having empathy. It's questioning yourself. Um, you know, I think when we look at some of the, the truly great leaders, we see that they do that all the time. Um, you know, they're always thinking, not, not always, you know, what can I do better, but how can I be better? Because when I'm better, I'm going to make it better for those around me. Um, you know, all of those various things. And I think that's where so many of the companies that fail have problems because they, you know, they, they, or, you know, the people around them put them on the pedestals and, you know, and, and then when, oh my gosh, they turn out to be human. It's just, you know, we can't believe it. Um, you know, and, and it's, and, and that's, that is kind of one of the weird things now about the cancel culture. Now, granted, there are, there are a lot of people who need to be canceled, right? Um, you know, they, say and do things that are not acceptable. Um, but other times it's like, you know, so they screwed up. They admitted it. They took whatever steps they needed to. And then they went on, you know, and, and I think that the, one of the, the hardest things for a leader to say is I'm sorry, it was my fault. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I want to go back to what you talked about with the pedestal. Mm -hmm. So another great leadership lesson from another Eddie Murphy character. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is in my second book mm -hmm. about uh, you know, what, what 80s pop culture teaches us about today's workplace. Mm -hmm. The second book, uh, the movie coming to America, one of my mm -hmm. favorites, I think um, for my money, the perfect romantic comedy. I think people forget because they think Eddie Murphy. They right. forget we just all think slapstick comedy, romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And it's a great one. Mm -hmm. uh, so coming to America uh, if you, again, if you haven't seen it, uh, I, please 
Mm-hmm. Do yourself there's no it. reason that you can't see these movies, folks. There's, you know, they're they're easy to, to get smart. online. Mm-hmm. Just please go watch it. You'll appreciate it. James Earl Jones. Do I need to say anything more? Mm-hmm. It has James Earl Jones. That should right. be enough. So, uh, yeah, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy's character, Prince Akeem, mm-hmm. he's the prince in his country of Zamunda, the heir to the throne. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning, we see him and everybody just wants to please him. And this is going back to your pedestal mm-hmm. thing. Everybody just wants to please him mm-hmm. uh, because of his station in life and who he is. And even when he's talking, you know, they're setting him up on a date or, you know, potential marriage. And he's asking, what do you like? And she says, whatever you like. What kind of food do you like? Whatever food do you like? And mm-hmm. he, he doesn't like this. Like, he, right. he really wants people to be themselves mm-hmm. around him and be themselves mm-hmm. an independent person. And, and so he says, I'm not going to be able to find this here because people, you know, they know I'm the prince. Right. So he takes off for Queens, New York to find his queen. And we can mm-hmm. have a conversation about, you know, was Queens, New York. And whether that was the perfect place to find his queens, uh, find his queen. But yeah, it's the movie, <laughs> blade, right? So he goes to Queens, Hoboken New York. wouldn't have had the same panache. <laughs> Hoboken <laughs> wouldn't have had the same effect. No, right? Hoboken would not have had it. Yeah, exactly right. Yes, Queens was perfect. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he and his his best friend, Sammy, played by Arsenio Hall, mm-hmm. they go to Queens, New York to find his queen. And he strips everything away that would have made him a prince. Mm-hmm. And he takes an entry job at a fast food restaurant called McDowell's, sweeping the floors, you know, taking out the garbage. And he said, I mean, listen, there's some great dialogue mm-hmm. coming to America. But what I love to find in my lessons is the throwaway line, the line that people might miss, or they're just mm-hmm. kind of, they just don't pay attention to it because it's not one that everybody talks about. And he says, when you think of garbage, think of Akeem. He's so proud to have this job mm-hmm. of sweeping the floors and taking the garbage mm-hmm. out. When you think of garbage, think of Akeem. Really, really important line in the movie because he has literally humbled himself to the point where he says, this is what I want. I don't want people to know that I'm a prince. Right. That life, the trappings of it, great. I don't want that. I want I want to, mm-hmm. I want people to love me and like me for me. Mm-hmm. And when he does this, what does he teach us? A really important lesson, this pedestal that you talked about. Mm-hmm. The difference between unearned leadership and earned leadership. Unearned leadership creates pleasers. Earned leadership creates believers. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is you, the pedestal. Mm-hmm. Under, when we haven't earned a leadership position, people tend to want to just please you because you don't know how to act as a leader and they right. don't know how to act around you. Mm-hmm. They just get yes people, yes men, mm-hmm. and yes women. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just tell people what they want to hear because they don't know what to do. And the leader, of course, doesn't know how to lead. Uh, they haven't earned it. When you earn that leadership position, then people can see that path and they have credibility. You have credibility in their eyes. Mm-hmm. We talk about you know the, the soldiers following the general into war. Well, why? Because... There's credibility there. They can see the experience that that mm-hmm. that that general in the military sense mm-hmm. or that general in the corporate sense has gone into battle before. Mm-hmm. And so now the people will say, yes, I've seen that experience. I will follow you mm-hmm. where you're going. And that's that earned leadership that mm-hmm. we talk about. And, and we're missing a lot of that. And so I think mm-hmm. that the difference between unearned leadership and earned leadership is that pedestal moment that you talk about. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and and. Unfortunately, like you said, you know, we we see the bad examples. I mean, right now, the biggest bad example of that would be Twitter. Um, you know, it was I bought this company, I am now in charge, and you will do anything I tell you to do. Right? That's exactly what Elon Musk was doing and is doing, and and is completely perplexed, it seems like. Now, this is obviously just based on media reports. So, you know, who, who really knows? But it seems like he's just thir- completely confused that people didn't sign on to work 80 hour weeks and um you know all of these various things it's like but but i'm elon musk you know i'm i'm going to make it great he did not earn anyone's respect in order for them to say yes we will do this yeah i think i mean i think you see that a lot when people come into new companies they they have their way of doing mm-hmm. things and Typically, what happens is there's a shakeout, and, and like they bring know, in their own people. Mm-hmm. We'll see. We'll see the results, you know, mm-hmm. of, of what happens when new leadership comes in in a lot of different companies. We're just having the shakeup at Disney, mm-hmm. uh, right? Uh, now this is somebody coming back to the right. Helm. Yeah, so people are a little wigged out. They're not quite sure you know, uh, what's going to happen. He's already starting to make some adjustments, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we, we have to kind of see, like, what is it that, that happens from these shakeouts that we see oftentimes when new leadership comes in. I, I experienced that a couple of times in my career, some mm-hmm. bad, uh, mm-hmm. some, some good, mm-hmm. some were, you know, even though it maybe affected me, I understood it. Right. I saw what mm-hmm. the particular person was trying to do mm-hmm. versus uh, other times where I thought, 
this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I may have been a casualty of it, but, you know, maybe there was a little bit of, hey, why me? Mm -hmm. But also, you know, in, in the end, it didn't work. Um, but it leads us to a really good lesson, too, from uh, a, what I, I would say was Prince Akeem being my number one leader from 80s pop culture, mm -hmm. uh, 80s movies. Mm -hmm. My second leader would be Ellen Ripley, mm -hmm. who was uh, Sigourney Weaver in Alien. Right. She was a bad... <laughs> Yes, yeah. a, a bad, a lot of things. Yes, we'll, we'll leave it there. Yes. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she's my number two profile mm -hmm. in leadership where I think Prince Akeem just uh, far and away is number one. Uh, she's, she's a, I shouldn't say far and away. She's a very close number two. Mm -hmm. And there's a great uh, moment in Aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's Alien, for those of you that know, there's Alien and Aliens. Yeah, there uh, were multiple, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little confusing, but the movies are great. Mm -hmm. So, and her character, Ellen Ripley, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a moment where there's a really important decision that needs to be made in the movie Aliens, where mm -hmm. there is going to be uh, an infrastructure that is that that is going to have to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And this is to save lives mm -hmm. and to actually save humanity, essentially. Right. There's a big conversation. I shouldn't say a big one, but there's a fairly minute and a half conversation about whether they should do this. We can't do this. There's all this money that's invested in it, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And she finally speaks up after all these guys are fighting back and mm -hmm. forth over what they should do. And she says, we're going to do it. Especially she says, we're going to do it. She says, and you can tell them to bill me. Mm -hmm. So that lesson, really important right there. Right. She, number, there's a couple of things happening in that moment. But number one is she's firm mm -hmm. in her decision. Right. Tell them to bill me. Mm -hmm. She's taking full responsibility mm -hmm. and accountability. I think we talked mm -hmm. about responsibility and accountability earlier. Mm -hmm. She's taking full responsibility and accountability for whatever happens on the back end mm -hmm. here, because she looks at it and says, the most important thing in this moment right here in the movie, mm -hmm. of course, is humanity, right? How do we save humanity? Mm -hmm. We have to do this thing that may not be popular, but I, as the leader, I'm telling right. you, to tell them mm -hmm. to build me. And I think in that moment, she wasn't just saying bill me in terms of the dollars. Mm -hmm. It was build me in terms of accountability. Right. Mm -hmm. Blame me. I will take responsibility. None of you here are responsible for mm -hmm. this. Don't worry about it. Even though you're leaders and you should be standing up and being responsible for this, it's okay. You can go cower over there. Yeah, yeah. Shoo, shoo. Yeah, let I'll let the you. let me take over, which she yeah. did. Mm -hmm. Which she did. And, and Actually, end, she didn't say let me take over. I'm taking over. Yeah, she said I'm taking over. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, again, like we can talk about different types of leadership. There are mm -hmm. moments where leaders need to really understand and, and listen to what everybody's mm -hmm. saying. And there are other times where humanity's at stake. Right. It's, it's the leader. old, the buck stops here, right? The buck stops here. And that's what she did. Mm -hmm. And so she takes, she's willing to take all the slings and arrows, not just for the team, mm -hmm. but for all of the other leaders mm -hmm. who aren't going to stand up. Right. You know, she's willing to put her head above water, so to speak, where everybody else is going to keep their heads just below water and just, you know, keep playing the game. Mm -hmm. She'll put her head up and say, no, no, I'm here. I'll take responsibility. Tell them to build me. And, right. And so that's, that's, you know, that's leadership. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and it's, it really is, it's, it's interesting when we look at those because you're right. There are the times where you have to be collaborative. And I think that's been part of the problem with what we have seen, you know, in the, the past couple of decades, lots of collaboration. Um, you know, I haven't been in corporate America for a while, but when I was uh, at a company um, and it's, you know, it's in my LinkedIn profile. So if anybody looks, it's there, um, big financial services company. And we went through mergers and acquisitions like big companies tend to do. And for whatever reason, the higher ups decided that my area was going to have co-CEOs. Oh. Yeah. You know, and, and so it was, it was one of those things where, because we basically had two huge companies that merged. And so each CEO became a co-CEO. It wasn't who's in charge. It's co-CEOs which sounded like this fun, collaborative, uh, no, it was horrible. I mean, it was like parents, you know, you didn't like what dad said, you went to mom, right? Um, you know, and, 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 yeah. and it was still very much us against them, you know, and, and, and that was what the big problem was because there wasn't one person in charge and whether we like it or not, in most cases, one person is in charge, you know, and, and now that, you know, with, with all dynamics that changes, but especially when hard decisions need to be made, that one person has got to say, 
It's on me. You know, this, this is my decision. If you don't like it, there's the door. Um, but I am the one that is making that decision. Yeah. And so you've, the co-CEO thing reminds you of like the, the person who's the head of sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. Right. Yeah. No, no. You know, it's just, You're um, very... yeah. And it's, it is, it's, you know, the, like we said, you, you collaborate, but then at some point you have to say, okay, this is, you know, I've heard all the views I've received all of that. Now we're going on. And that again is the difference between that leader and maybe that manager. The manager might still be trying to get a consensus when they get run over. <laughs> you know? um, that's yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly right. I mean, it sounds like simple, but yeah, the manager's mm -hmm. manager. Yeah, I, you know, I, this, it's a very good point. And um, it does, you know, you were talking about the collaboration, collaborating. Mm -hmm. It points me to a lesson from uh, my first book, actually. Mm -hmm. One that I wrote that I'm very proud of because it mm -hmm. kind of launched this whole thing, but it's also only about 60 pages. So just be prepared if you buy the first book, you, you know. Quick read. It's a quick read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but they're the movie, The Goonies, mm -hmm. and one of my favorites. And so um, there's an obvious lesson in the mo movie, The Goonies, about teamwork, but mm -hmm. there's a bigger lesson in the movie. And um, for hopefully most of you have seen The Goonies. It's kind of an iconic classic movie, mm -hmm. uh, 80s movie. Uh, the kids are looking, trying to save their town from a developer and they have no power to do so, mm -hmm. but they're going to go on this, this, this adventure to find the treasure left by one-eyed Willie, the pirate one-eyed Willie to see if they can find the treasure and save their town. And at one point, Chunk, uh, who is just this, such a lovable character, uh, Chunk gets captured by a family of bandits mm -hmm. and he's thrown into the basement with this character, Sloth. Mm -hmm. Now, Sloth is chained up in the basement. Simply because of the way he looks. Mm -hmm. He's got a cone-shaped head. He's got ears of wiggle, crooked eyes, missing right. teeth. He's different. Different. And as Chunk so eloquently states, mm -hmm. he smells like phys ed. Um, so, so Sloth has all these things going against him. And he's put down there by the this, this same family of bandits. He's actually part of that family, but they, they put him down there in the basement. And at first, Chunk is scared of him, but his first instinct is to try to make friends with him. Mm -hmm. So he offers up a baby Ruth. He throws a chocolate bar at him, hits Sloth in the head. Sloth gets really upset, breaks his chains. Chunk thinks this is it, but that's not what it's about. It's just that he wants the chocolate bar. He picks up Sloth, picks up Chunk, kisses mm -hmm. him, and Chunk says that's when he says, man, you smell like Fizzed. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens there? Chunk invites Sloth into the family of Goonies, right? He invites him into the group of Goonies. And when he does that, he teaches us a really important lesson about inclusion. Mm -hmm. And this idea of including everyone, regardless mm -hmm. of their own shaped heads and the fact that their ears may go, they smell like phys ed. I yeah. smell like phys ed on, on certain days. So um, he invites he invites men to the group of Goonies. Really important moment about lesson about inclusion mm -hmm. that it's the human thing to do. It's the right thing to do mm -hmm. to include everybody. When we look at it from a business perspective, though, mm -hmm. and we think about our businesses, spoiler alert. This movie has a happy ending, as almost every 80s movie did. I movie. know. Mm -hmm. yeah, the heroes right. didn't like, usually die. Everybody no, was happy. happy. Mm -hmm. they, you know, there wasn't a ton of realism in it, but that's okay. Like mm -hmm. they, The happy endings are, are good to see. And mm -hmm. so uh, it, ha it ends happily because of Sloth. Mm -hmm. They actually get the treasure and save their town, but only because of Sloth. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they invited group Sloth into the group of Goonies. Mm -hmm. They embraced him. And what does he do in return? He shows his two biggest traits, which are his heart mm -hmm. and his loyalty right. to the Goonies. And then his third trait, which is his physical strength. Mm -hmm. And he's able to help them get to the treasure and save their town. Mm -hmm. and that idea of inclusion in the workplace, that person that we don't include in the meetings, maybe the person who's a new employee, maybe they're in a different area. Maybe it's they're in data entry and we're in marketing. But hey, let's open up that meeting mm -hmm. and let's see if this person may, might have something to offer. We just right. haven't asked. Mm -hmm. We haven't asked. We haven't invited mm -hmm. them into the group. Mm -hmm. We haven't brought them in. Mm -hmm. Bring everybody in from a business perspective, and you mm -hmm. might be surprised who can actually offer you the solution to your problem. Right. The movie The Lost Boys with the Frog Brothers is another mm -hmm. great one. And that one teaches us the same idea about how, to pro how problem solvers mm -hmm. don't come in a one-size-fits-all package. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake that we make a lot of times. We look to the title. We say, oh, well, that person has a title. They must be, a, they must be the problem solver. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Your problem solver may be the person over here that just hasn't been invited into mm -hmm. the meeting. Or right. Really important person. Right. It's like we were saying, the leader quite often is not the person with that title, you know, being in charge, all of those various things. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, and it, it's funny because a lot of things have come full circle. 
you know, things got kind of mixed up there in the 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 nineties and the 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 two thousands. That's always a hard decade to try and figure out what the heck we even call it. Um, because like you said, inclusion. I mean, you know, now DEI is this big thing, and it's like, no, no, it, it should be. I mean, you know, that's that's the the thing is we need to remember that we we have got to include everyone. And I think that's where virtual workplaces have, have really, you know, added an awful lot to that. But, you know, it, thinking back and, and yeah, you know, it was, it is, it's the breakfast club. It's, you know, you get these, these five kids together who have absolutely nothing in common besides the same high school and roughly the same age, right? That's, that's pretty much it. And they become that team that is successful. Um, you know, and, and so that's, I think, you know, where, where we need to, to be looking back is going, okay, what do we do? Well, oh my gosh, Chris. We you know, this, we I knew, yeah. yeah, you know, we have to have you on again, because we did talk about Field of Dreams. I think Field of Dreams is, is a fascinating story, because a lot of times people go, okay, I'm going to, you know, if you build it, they will come. So they think, I, if I start this company, it, people will buy from me. No, that's not the lesson from Field of Dreams. Um, yeah. You know, and 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 I always tell people, no, you know, go back, go back, you know, listen, watch it again, um, you know, and 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 because there are so many more examples of what you know what we can do with all of this, and so we, yeah, we have to have you on again. This is, has just been great. Um, but until then, tell us a little bit more specifically about how people find you, what are the services that you provide, and, and how do they connect with you? Yeah, great. So people can find me at chrisclues.com, C-L-E-W-S, C-H-R-I-S-C-L-E-W-S.com. I'm on all of the socials except t- t- TikTok. I will, I'll be honest, I've not uh, gotten into TikTok yet. Mm-mm. I probably won't. Um, but I am on Twitter. I am on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Facebook and also Instagram. Um, spend the bulk of my time probably on LinkedIn and Instagram, mm-hmm. and Facebook. Those are the three that I focus on the most. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I actually, uh, keynote speaker. So I'm available to organizations, associations. I can customize, uh, the content for whatever it is that mm-hmm. your organization or association is looking for. I have about 150 lessons or so from about 50 or 60 of the great eighties movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is plenty of content out there, whether it's, uh, you know, leadership, workplace culture, sales, marketing, communications, life in general. Uh, I can touch on all of those topics. And speaking of life, I did want to touch on one quick thing that we talked about. Uh, the movie Dead Poet Society, which is also in my third book here. John Keating, the, the teacher played by Robin Williams, another great one we lost way too soon. Uh, so John Keating, you know, we all know Carpe Diem sees the day, I think, from, from the, the Dead Poet Society. Right. Another thing that he says, no matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. And uh, in the palm of our hand today, we have the ability to get our words and ideas out to the world. It's the great equalizer. You don't need to be an athlete, an entertainer, a world leader, a celebrity, or any of those things to get your words and ideas out to the world. You can do it in the palm of your hand today. That's 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 talking the talk, but you got to walk the walk. And for me, it's animal rescue. Uh, I have my boy Bodie here. He's an 80-pound pit mix sitting at my feet right now. Love him to death. Um, he started his life at three months old, paralyzed on the street, couldn't go to the bathroom, was 24 hours from dying. A couple of cops found him, scooped him up, took him to a rescue that I follow. And two and a half years later, uh, we've been together for, yeah, for two and a half years now. And uh, I was brought up to just really be a huge proponent of animal rescue. I donate a portion of the proceeds from my keynote speaking gigs and my book sales to Wonder Paul's Rescue, which is the rescue that saved Bodie. And uh, so, yes, rescued, I'd say, is uh, the best breed, at least for me. And um, that's a really important lesson that I think that we get from Dead Poet Society and, and a really important life lesson as well. I love it. Well, you know, I always ask for a final thought, but there's nothing that can top that. So, you know, it, it is something that we all need to, to be thinking about is, you know, maybe that's it. How do we make the difference? You know, what, what is it going to say on our headstone? Kind of the eh or wow? Um, so Chris, I can't wait to, to talk with you again. We are going to have such a great time. I'm Deb Creer. I've been having an absolutely wonderful discussion with Chris Clues. And until next time, everyone have a great day. Stay rad, everybody. Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.